We begin now with the survivor stories of Anita Lahner and Robert Fire, who are both children during the Holocaust. In preparation for our live discussion, we would like to present this video of their story. My name is Anita Lahner. I am 90 years old. I live in Del Mar, and I am a Holocaust survivor. I experienced Gestapo coming to our house, and they came with uh, guns facing us, and they put the whole family by the wall. My mother, I remember, held me in front of her for hours. They turned the whole house upside down. It was a lot of yelling, raus Jude, verfluchte Jude. It, it was very scary. It's a memory that never leaves me. I was hiding uh, in apartment of my father's friend, Dr. Toczyski, who saved my life. Gestapo came next day, took us to uh, Gestapo, and I remember being told by my mother, never let yourself be taken to Gestapo because you never will come back from there. So they took all of us, this couple and this young woman and me, walking on the street under the guns. And it reminds me of Anne Frank because she was put from the apartment onto a truck, but I was walking, so we were on foot. And at one point, as we were walking, there were a lot of people on the streets, probably four o'clock after work. All of a sudden, I heard this voice, run now. And the voice became repetitious and very strong. And I saw one door to apartment building open. And as much as I was afraid that they would shoot me, I ran into that door. And somehow, nobody noticed. The humanity never experienced anything like it. The concentration camps, the gas chambers, children being taken away from parents, children uh, tortured, uh, people uh, killed for nothing and if we don't learn about this we are up to repeat history take your arms to the shoulders level start elongating coming away from the gravity i got into yoga and yoga saved my life kept me grounded and may we come from darkness to light, from death. You just take, you know, the teachings makes you realize what, you know, is important in life. What, you know, to sift, to separate the bad from good. Yeah, I, I was uh, mesmerized, if you want, and, and uh, intrigued by uh, by her background, her history, and her Holocaust survival. Well, my compliments to the chef. Thank you. Yes, you're very good. This is Edda Schenkerman that introduced us, and subsequently we met first time and dated on April 10th, 2015. 
close to 10,000, mostly Jewish kids, were transported to England from Austria, Germany, Czechoslovakia. When, when the Germans, with the Anschluss, when the Germans uh, took over Austria, they rounded up Jewish men, and uh, my father, amongst them, was sent to Dachau, the concentration camp near Munich. And he was there for a very short while, was there for three weeks. There was no final solution at that time. And uh, my father had been a World War I veteran in the Austrian army and he was released after three weeks. But he was told that he had to leave the country and he had a visa to go to Shanghai, but instead he went illegally to Palestine. This was early 39 or late 38. So then my mother was left with me and her father and she asked her father, would you take care of Robert so I can join my, fa my husband? And my, my grandfather kind of indirectly saved my life because he said, if you leave Robert with me, he'll be the death of me. Because I was a little bit a uh, hyper kid. So then she must have uh, found out about the kinder transport. I never talked to her about it, so that's all I know. And she got me on the kinder transport. And the kinder transport, in that sense, saved my life. I don't consider myself a Holocaust survivor because I was on a kinder transport and I didn't suffer like she did. It's very interesting to me that he kind of like lives in denial that he is, uh, maybe this is a modus operandi for survival because I always say you are a survivor, no question. I mean, you were at age of five put on a train without your parents, without anybody you knew, and you were thrown into a completely foreign environment. And, uh, and he told me he was crying all night, but he insists that he is not a Holocaust survivor. Um, well, I, I, everything is relative. Everybody deals differently with their pain. Please help me welcome Anita and Robert to the stage. Robert's 89, by the way, so he's robbing the cradle here. <laughs> She's a cougar. She's a cougar, that's right. <laughs> so, um, Robert, uh, just later on in that same interview, Robert starts talking about himself as a Holocaust survivor. Um, so it's complicated, right? It's, it's complicated um, because survivorship looks different for different people. And so I wanted to talk to uh, you about that. You, you did end up calling yourself a survivor towards the end of our interview. Um, so tell us about your struggle of identifying yourself as a survivor. I mean, you've stuck to a certain story most of your life. Well, I, I didn't identify myself as a survivor because uh, everything is relative. And my, my situation was, uh, benevolent compared to Anita's and compared to people that were in concentration camps. But, uh, by the way, that was a very moving video that you did, and congratulations. Well, they were your words, so. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you put it together. Thank you for your time. Uh, I, I'm convinced now, I talked to my son-in-law, and he said, of course you're a survivor, what you went through. And I don't think I went through that much, but when I think of my grandkids going through that, it brings tears to my eyes. That's right, there is trauma when a child is separated from the parents for so long and placed into 
a very foreign and scary situation. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Anita, you lost 60 family members in the Holocaust. I can't even imagine just generations of family members, um, including your dear aunt, whom you said that you were closer to than your own mother. And um, can you share the story um, briefly about the day that your mother found you at a Red Cross orphanage, but when she came in to pick you up, she said, oh, I'm her aunt rather than your mother. And that caused a lot of confusion and some very complex feelings. Can you share that experience? Yes, I, I was in the orphanage. It was after the war. And uh, a teacher came to tell me that in the mistress's office is waiting my aunt. And I had a very dear aunt who taught me a lot, and I loved her. She was a pediatrician, and uh, she disappeared. She was taken to guest chamber with her daughter, my cousin. And the day doesn't go by that I don't think about them. Mm -hmm. And so I was hoping that this is this aunt, somehow I lived in denial that she died, then maybe she showed up. And when I came to the office, I saw my mother, and I had this incredible mixture of feelings. It's good that I see my mother, by why she doesn't admit that she's my mother, only she says she's my aunt. And it took me years to kind of think about this and realize that people were so, were so petrified of their own identity that maybe that's why she did it. People were afraid to be who they are because they were killed who, for who they were. So my mother could never answer this question. And I found this to be so profound because we really take for granted here in this country being able to call ourselves by our names. And the Jews could not. They were numbers, or they, could, they had to hide right. who they were. And so I thank you for sharing that story, because it's just a reminder of just how privileged we are just to be able to identify with, I am a mother, I am who I am here. Um, Robert, you had mentioned in the video that you never talked to your mom or your parents about the kinder transport. And um, help us to understand that, because I don't know. I, I would imagine that you know, that might have come up, or is that just something that the family never talked about? Well, I, I joined my parents when I was uh, 12, 12 and a half years old, after seven years being in Scotland. And as a teenager, I, I, I never thought about it. Mm. I, I never You're thinking thought, about girls. I, I mean, I admit <laughs> now that I didn't ask my mother mm. all sorts of questions, I, but I, I didn't. A, a question I would love to ask her, how did you get me on a kinder transport? Mm. What, what did you have to pay money? Did you uh, use uh, influence? I have no idea. Wow, wow. And you found out later in life, being connected to other kinder transport children who are now adults, that many of the young women who are on the kinder transport went through very traumatic events, too. Yeah, I, I was five, almost six years old when I left. And I, I can't compare the suffering that I had with a, a 12 or 13 year old girl that uh, went, went to school, went to sixth grade, seventh grade, uh, spoke German, I spoke German too. But as a five-year-old kid, I, all, all I'd gone to was kindergarten. And uh, the, these, uh, these women that I met at the kinder transport meeting in Washington, in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, 25 years ago, their stories were terribly sad. Mm. They, not, not only did they lose, in most cases, they never saw their parents again but they missed their parents. I missed my parents, but a five-year-old gets over trauma very quickly. At least I did. And I've 
there's a movie called Into the Arms of Strangers, which I would encourage everyone to see because it, it talks about these uh, women that were kinder transport and they were sexually abused. They, they missed their parents. They tried to communicate with their parents and it, it was very sad. So when I look at my experience vis-a-vis -vis theirs, again, I had it pretty easy. Mm. I, I went to different places. I was, while, I, while I was in Scotland, I lived in about seven or eight different homes. I was in uh, hostels. We talked about hostels. That, that's what we called them. They were not uh, hostels. Uh, they like were like boarding, boarding facilities. schools. Mm -hmm. And I was in Jewish hostels. I was in Christian hostels. My first, the, the first people that I joined were Christian scientists, the Foley's. They had a son named Kevin. And that picture that you see me with their dog, that was uh, at uh, Granny's uh, house, their grand grandmother in Edinburgh. And I stayed there for six months. And then I went to another private home. Then I went to a, a Mr. and Mrs. Cohen furniture manufacturers, and uh, I stayed with them for a while. Then I went to a Christian hostel, and after the Christian hostel, I uh, went to a hostel in Castle Douglas, Kirkudbury, and then from there I went to a farm to Glasgow. And then from Glasgow, I went to uh, Poulton House, which was a farm school. And that's where I finally left Poulton House, went to Liverpool, and took a liberty ship to Palestine so in 1946. That must be very traumatic, even though you, you're listing moving from place to place right, as a child. Um, so I wanted to ask both of you, uh, Anita, you have said, not a day goes by that I don't think about my cousin and my aunt. And all of the moving, I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you've both had amazing lives. You've had beautiful children, you have grandchildren. In fact, one of your daughters, Andrea, is here in the audience. Andrea, wherever you are, thank you so much for being here. Um, and yet, the Holocaust and the stories and your experience has stayed with you your whole lives. I wanted to ask you just how has that showed up in your life? You had mentioned PTSD a little bit, anxiety maybe a little bit, but how have you carried this throughout your life? Let's start with um, Anita. Well, I, like I said, the day doesn't go by that I don't think about uh, what happened. And uh, it, it is a heavy burden that uh, I sort of uh, carry with me, and I not always share because people were not born in this time and have very hard time to even sometimes listen to the stories. So it stays basically with me. I share with Robert. Mm. Uh, and I try to forget throughout life as well to make life as normal as possible. Uh, but I remember all the stories, and if I may tell you one story of survival that is very significant to me, because it was a first contact with uh, uh, actually what, for me, what was going on. I, I, I had to leave home because everybody was ordered to go to ghetto and I was placed in ghetto with many people. We slept on the floors in a room like, oh, 25 people in one small room, and the children were made to wash bathrooms. Mm. And I was told by my mother that in such and such time, and such and such day, 
somebody will come to take me out of the uh, ghetto. And miraculously, I remember the date and I remember the time. It was like already cold, September probably, it's cold in Poland. And I, I went to that fence where I was supposed to meet somebody. I was told when I went to ghetto that somebody will come to take me out of ghetto. And at that particular hour, maybe it was four o'clock, it was already dark, I heard a voice, lie down on your stomach, dig the hole with your hands in the ground so you can slide under the fence and I will pull you by the hand. And I did that and there was a hand that pulled me out and it was a young boy, maybe 15 years old. It's hard for me to, they to tell what old was this boy and he took me, what you saw today on the video to Dr. Toczyski, my fa the father's friend who saved my life. And I went from that house to other houses. So I just wanted to share the story of, you know, Polish people also helped. There were some good people who helped people to survive. And I am thankful for my life. Thank you for sharing that beautiful story. Thank you so much, Anita. Robert, um, how about you? How has this experience um, showed up in your life? Well, I think the fact that I was buffeted around from place to place, and I kind of blame myself for that because I was hyper and I was <laughs> not a good kid and uh, caused a lot of trouble. And uh, it manifests itself today that uh, I could consider myself having an abandonment complex. Mm. And I call my kids and Andrea could <laughs> testify to the ver veracity of that, that I call them every day. And if they travel, if my grandkids travel, I'm always concerned. And maybe that's just being a parent, but I think there's more to it than that. Sure. Now you both mentioned grandchildren, or you mentioned a grandchild. So I wanted to mention you, one of your grandsons, his name is Joel Fire. He's finishing up med school. He's gonna be doing his residency at UC Irvine. And he actually wrote, when he was like 11 or 12, he yeah. wrote a paper on his grandfather, uh, Robert, and I'm gonna read just a real quick excerpt. The train screeched as it painfully rolled away from the Vienna station. Confused parents watched as their kids were torn apart from them. Inside, a lonesome five-year-old sat quietly in the large gray chair, peering out in the blackness of, of night. Little did that small boy know that he was caught in the middle of the largest, most horrific genocide recorded in history, written by your grandson. We also have from your granddaughter, Lauren, who is, she's in high school, maybe 14, 15? She's 16. 16. Oh, turning 16, got it. She wrote a poem, and I'll just read a few lines. Oh, dear Nana, you're so amazing. Your life is one that I really must tell. Look at your family are here who love you and so many friends as well. She talks about you going from Poland to America. And then she says, so here we are, your dreams came true, the world's a better place because of you. And I share these stories because what's really important for both those who are Jewish and beyond is to allow these next generations to tell the stories and pass them on. Any thoughts on that, on you know, hearing these words from your grandchildren that you've already seen, but the importance of passing on the torch as we wrap up this conversation. My granddaughter uh, was bat mitzvah. She wasn't interested before that. And then she studied Jewish, started studying Jewish history. 
she went to uh, Louisiana with a group uh, led by her rabbi from their temple, and she learned about American Jews fighting for black freedom and dying for black freedom. Mm. And she was very moved. And she since then is studying Jewish history and very proud of being Jewish. She makes an effort. She's now in a special class that it's a college credit uh, through the temple about Jewish history. And uh, if we are winding up, I wanted just to play a tribute to Liam Kim, to Elizabeth Tobias, for carrying the subject. It's a subject not only for Jews, it's for the humanity because we're seeing around the world a lot of crime done against humanity. And I don't know where some people are okay with this, but we have to, we have to fight it. We have to, uh, for a young generation, to fight for truth, to see and sift truth from the lies, from the deniers who are today becoming a very strong voice of deniers of Holocaust history. So we need to study history. We need to learn from proper sources. We always have to check what we're learning, what kind of things from what sources. And the sources are good respectful universities and good agencies f form for yourself frame of mind that you will know the real truth and you will follow the truth in your life and carry the truth because if you allow the truth to slowly die, we have no freedom. Mm. And deniers are only having in mind holding on to power, not your good will in, in their mind or heart. And if you lose freedom, you become a slave. So it's a topic, it's a subject for the humanity, not only for Jews. Mm. Spoken. Now, now you know why Spoken. I love her so much. <laughs> now we know why you love her so much. Spoken like a true journalist. And by the way, Anita was a journalism major. So when she talks about the commitment to truth, it also comes from an academic and also emotional and spiritual standpoint. Robert, any last words that you want to say, whether about passing on the torch or anything that you would like to add? Well, I dedicate this whole thing to my grandchildren, mm. and uh, uh, one, one of them is at uh, UCSD, and he's uh, talking to, uh, joining Hillel, and, which, uh, and uh, his, his father is not Jewish, and uh, his mother and father have in their home Black Lives Matter, mm. so they are following in my window. late wife's uh, missives uh, of a liberal secular Judaism. Mm. That's awesome. I believe that this is your first time speaking publicly about this, and um, we're just so grateful. I'd like to invite Dr. Sanchez to come up because he has a special presentation for both of you. So, uh, Dr. Sanchez, I'm going to give you these certificates to present. There you go. Brandon, Michael, okay, thank you. Robert, Anita, it's been an honor to have you with us today. So I would like to present these certificates of appreciation to both of you for your sharing of your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
If you can look over thank there, there's one, one, one. For being here, and thank you for this beautiful college for caring for truth. Oh. Thank you so much, Anita and Robert. All right, we're gonna move on. Our next two guests, um, it's my pleasure to introduce. First, we have Nicolette Monique Luna, who will be serving as our guest moderator. So Nikki, you could head on up. She is a 16-year-old Bonita Vista High School junior, but she's dual enrolled at Southwestern College. She is also editor-in-chief of Southwestern College El Sol magazine. She's won numerous journalism awards, including what's considered the collegiate Pulitzer Prize, and she's reported extensively on our second guest, Holocaust survivor Benjamin Midler, who I'd like to um, bring up to the stage as well. Let's welcome him as he comes on up to the stage. And then while he is on his way here, let's take a few minutes to learn more about Ben from this recent 10 News clip. So I wouldn't say I'm not only a survivor, I'm a miracle survivor. I believed always in God, and God helped me to survive. A local 95-year-old Holocaust survivor is going on a once-in-a-lifetime mission to Poland, where he survived six concentration camps, including Auschwitz. ABC 10 News reporter Moses Small met Ben Midler to learn more about his incredible story. Benjamin Midler was born in 1928 in a small town in eastern Poland. His life changed forever when Nazi Germany occupied the country, forcing his entire family into a ghetto. The first thing that they did, shoved in between 1,000 and 1,500 people to the big synagogue to put it on fire. Midler lived in this ghetto for two years, losing his father and uncle. The remaining family members were loaded into trains bound for concentration camps. I've been to six camps because... When I was separated from my family, I wanted to be back with my family. So Midler volunteered to travel from camp to camp, avoiding execution by working a range of jobs. But that wasn't his only survival tactic, when hundreds of thousands also died of starvation. So I'm not ashamed to say I would see if the people don't move. I would look if he left bread left over, because all the people tried to leave food for later. Midler was liberated when World War II ended in 1945, the only survivor from his family. You had gone through so much so young. You had lost family members, and you had to survive for years out of your childhood. So tell me about some of the things that helped you get through all of that. Not to think about nothing, just to stay alive. And that gave me the strength to go through the, the Holocaust. Not to think about it, not to live with it. Give me the strength for a new life. So Miller says his new purpose is educating others about the Holocaust. He's taking a trip to Poland Monday to see Auschwitz decades later as a free man. We hope should never ever forget and to speak up for anti-Semitism, for hatred, hatred and bigotry is bringing to, to kill each other. And we got to stop them, we got to love each other. Moses Small, ABC 10 News. Wow. Well, Midler will spend nine days on his trip traveling to Poland, then visiting Israel. He will be joined by soldiers from the Israeli Defense Forces. Hello, Ben. Hi. Thank you for being here. Last year, I had the honor of interviewing you for the El Sol magazine for an article that we wrote, including your story for Holocaust Remembrance. And I'm thrilled to have you here again today. And this time with so many more people to hear your story firsthand, because that is just so powerful to be there in person and hear it one to one. Um, and we have about 22 minutes today to talk. And I'd like to get through at least five questions that I have to you. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to ask if there's anything too personal or too sensitive that I shouldn't mention or ask about. Nothing personal. All I think, I don't live in the past, I live for the future. And that gives me to raise a family the best that I can. And uh, it helps me a lot. And I even went to a 
five days ago, I went to Poland and I went to uh, Israel with 80 people, with FIDF. And it was a little hard because I remembered my youth. I'll read it a few words later. Only that gave me the strength This I did the right thing by living for the future and not with the past. Thank you. And you mentioned remembering your youth. Could you talk to us about what it was like in the 1930s when the Nazis first started invading Poland and here, like the first time that you heard about Adolf Hitler? Could you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, at that time, there was not too many newspapers. And because I'm from Bialystok, you heard the, new, the song, but not too many newspapers, mostly on radio. And we hear on the radio, this, the Nazis are uh, conquering a lot of countries in Europe. And we knew this hour, uh, we are in line next, because we are in Poland, is part of Europe. So we, we were ready for it, only we didn't know what's going on. So we didn't think too much about it. We went on with life. In 1939, they finally come to Poland. The only thing is, I got to tell a little history, because at that time, Nazi was afraid of opening up a second front, so they allowed the Russian to, they divided Poland in two parts, eastern part, where Bialystok is, uh, is there, to give it to the Russian, in the western part to, to the Nazis. So we were lucky. This for two years, we didn't feel the Nazi regime. We didn't feel any difference. We were on the Russian occupation to 1941, until the war. The Russian Cold War, the Barbarossa. The Nazis uh, again came into Poland in, uh, in June of 22, 90, 1941. And on my birthday, on June 27, 1941, they came in, and the first thing they did, they burned the synagogue, the big synagogue, with between 1,000 to 1,500 men and women, and burned them alive, and they didn't let the fire department to put out the fire. And that was my start. In that time, I was only 13 years old. Thank you so much for sharing You're that. And you mentioned your youth and survival. And when I interviewed you the first time, you had mentioned that you're alive today because of three miracles. Could you tell us about those? About, could you repeat, please? Um, the three miracles. You had said that you are alive because of three miracles. Could you tell us about them? About what? The three miracles. The three miracles. Three miracles? Uh, when was liquidation of the ghetto, so was up. So everybody was looking to hide himself because we, nobody wants to get taken to concentration camps or to or to, to crematoriums. So my uncle would live not far from the fence. We built a hiding place. So we were there, 35 people. The reason we built a hiding place was in in 1943. By being already in the ghetto, they rounded up 20, a lot of people, but they didn't work. And because my father was taken before, in 1941, they rounded up 5,000 men and women, and my father was between them. They took him out to the forest and they killed him. So because I'm the only one, the oldest in the family, so I went to work as a presser, so they wouldn't take me it, so, so I wouldn't be able to get rationing of food. In uh, the February 25, all the people that they didn't work, they deported them. That's why my, my uncles built the hiding place. In uh, August 16 of 1943, was the liquidation of the ghetto and there was an uprising. The uprising was the people with guns. There is no power against tanks. So what the uprising did was a lot of wooden houses. So they went and they put them on fire. Because my uncle's house was not far, so we smelled smoke. So my uncle and his son and me went out to the yard. And the uh, uh, Germans were waiting for us. And they marched us outside of town. You know, uh, 
Bialystok was 65% of population Jewish, and they couldn't bring trains in one day. So on the third day, they rounded up 500 men, and that was my first miracle. Miracle from God, because the question, I'll tell you this, when they took me to the first concentration camp, Majdanek, we didn't do no work. We had to take uh, stones from one place to another. Why would they take separated 500 men and put them in three separate cars? The train itself went to Treblinka. Treblinka was a camp, extermination camp. These three cars, they put them in the end of the train, and they, they, all the train went, and they, the three cars, they unhooked, put them on a rail line, separate on the side. They came back, the locomotive, and took us to Majdanek. That's the first miracle. The second miracle, my uncle and his son and me, we were there. After two months, came over a few officers with a nice-dressed man, and they said, everybody should say what they worked in the ghetto. Because my uncle was auto mechanic working for the army during the, uh, the occupation, so he told me I should say the same thing. Usually, young people listen to the oldest. I say, OK. The only thing that they came to me, ask me what I did, I got scared. And I told them I was a presser. So they asked me, how come a presser, young, young man like you, was a presser? So I told them my father died. He didn't tell them he got killed. And I had to go to work to support my family. He liked my answer. And so it happened, they looked for tailors and shoemakers, because at that time, the, the war going on, the, the Nazis were almost close to Moscow, and over there it was very cold during the winter, and they need warm clothes, so they look for tailors and shoemakers. The presser is a part of the tailor uh, branch, so they took only 200 men, they sent it to a different uh, camp. If I wouldn't tell, wouldn't lie and tell them the truth, because always I go with the truth, I wouldn't be alive today. That's my second miracle. My third miracle was I always volunteered to go from one camp to another. I was very close to my family, and I did everything. I did any work they asked me, and I always volunteered to go from one camp to another. And I figured any camp can be any worse wherever I am. I was on the Camp Majdanek, the second camp was Brigine. There was tailors and shoemakers, only I didn't work as a tailor and a shoemaker. I worked in a quarry breaking up stones to build highways and roads for one year. Over there I got typhus, and uh, I got over it because I was young. And the third miracle was from there I volunteered to go to another, because the front was closed, so they sent us to uh, Sachsenhausen. In Sachsenhausen, I was a couple of months, so I moved to Ordruf. I was in six camps. My fifth camp was Ordruf. Over there, we built a, a factory where they built the V2. The missiles were, the shoot, were shooting on over England. Because, again, they asked volunteers, so I moved down to Babelsberg. There's a suburb of Berlin. We were cleaning the street of Berlin during the day because the Allied forces, the British and the American, were uh, bombing the, Nazi, the German uh, 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 cities at night. Uh, in 1990, I wrote a book, The Life of a Child Survivor from Bialystok, Poland. And by writing the book, I saw an article from an officer, but he wrote an article in San Diego Union Tribune. This he was there, and he showed a picture this Dwight Eisner standing with officers, including him, with people from the village, to show how the Germans killed the prisoners wherever they were in the camp. Again, if I wouldn't volunteer, I wouldn't be alive today in talking to you. And my fourth miracle, the last, was in Babelsberg. Uh, after I was liberated, Everybody was running to the houses to get food because we were in a suburb. And nobody, uh, we were all uh, skin and bones. You can't eat food 
when your stomach doesn't take, so everybody got dysentery and died. At the age of 16 and a half, I got measles. I didn't know it measles. I had a lot of red spots on my body, so they thought I got some sickness, so they took me to the hospital. Nobody get at age 16 measles. And then they told me I have measles. So without these four miracles, I wouldn't be standing today and talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to talk more about the concentration camps. Could you tell us what a day in Auschwitz was like? Uh, when I was in Birkenau, I was in two, there was two Auschwitz. One Auschwitz was Auschwitz A, and the other one was Auschwitz Birkenau. I was in Birkenau. In Birkenau, I came from Blegin, so the beginning we didn't go through a selection. After a couple of months, they, everybody had to go through a selection. So they put up two boards, horizontal and vertical, and wherever didn't touch the top board, would go to the crematorium. So by some reason, I don't know how and what, I stand up on my toes and I touch the top board and they send me back to the barracks. Because I the rest of the people, wherever didn't touch it, went straight to the crematorium. And at that time, was a, a big table with people, was they were branding, giving out, putting out numbers on the, on the prisoners. In the Auschwitz A, they put on an A and the number on the outside of the arm. In Birkenau, they put on a number inside the arm. My number is B2433. And the reason they give the number, only wherever went through the selection and they went back to the barracks. Every prisoner, every, anybody, wherever was in any camps, didn't get any numbers. They're only getting a piece of fabric with a number. If the person died, the numbers died. Nobody knows how many people died except from, uh, from the archive what German kept. I'm sorry, I haven't got the paper with me. It's got it in my book over here in the note. This I went through six concentration camps. Not what I say, because the German kept the archive and the Red Cross to cover. So I wrote a, a letter and I got this I was in six camps. I'm not saying just because I was, wo just to say it, only I was in six camps. Wow, thank you. And it must have been so difficult to go And the day in the, in the concentration camp was, you get food, imitation coffee, with a slice of bread, in lunchtime, soup, but there's only a color. It's haven't got no potatoes, or no any noodles or anything else. At dinner time, a slice of bread. A lot of people, all the people would keep the bread for later, only not the young people. Young people eat it right away. Only a lot of times, old people, because not only the old, they're getting weak from working and, and checking, living in the concentration camps was very hard. So at night they die. I'm not ashamed to say that when I saw people doesn't move, I would touch them, move them. If it doesn't move, I would take their bread, but they kept it for later and ate it. And that's why give me the strength. And all the strength to live through that. All the time I thought about my family, how to be together. Because I left them in the hiding place in the bunker. And I thought, this is still alive. And this gave me the strength to live through it. I didn't think about nothing else. I saw, close my mind, this I even forget this I had a sister. Because I had a brother of eight years old. His name was Arya, and I had a sister, Matilda age of five. And I forget I had a sister, and only I find out when the, my relatives, my mother's three sisters was born in the United States from 1918, showed me a picture, this I'm with my brother and sister. That much I shut out my life. I didn't talk to any prisoners, to any people in the camp. I just kept everything to myself. Do the work that had to be done, and get on, 
just to stay alive. And could you talk a little bit more about what your drive was to survive such horrible circumstances in such a dark time? What motivated you to move forward? Be motivated, like I say, this the family is still alive. And we were very close. We were very close. This I didn't think of nothing else, how to be together. And this gave me the strength and the willpower. I got very willpower even today. If I decide something to do, I don't give up. I do it. If not today, I'll do it later. Only nothing stands in my way if something got to be done. And that's my way of life. My way of life, I live for the future, and this gives me the strength to get over, not to live in the past. I want to say this. I want to read for you, because I was now in the concentration camps. I went for a visit with IDF, with 80 people, and we went to Poland. I went to Auschwitz. It brings a little back memories. Walking through the Auschwitz-Birkenau, walking through Auschwitz-Birkenau has been memories of my reason for survival. As a child, going through the experience, I had strong willpower and compartmentalized my emotion. My thought was to believe in God in the hope of reunite my family. Men's humanity, anti-Semitism, and the loss of my youth could have killed me. I used my faith to create a new life, in love myself and my family, making me a stronger person. Today, I'm compelled to speak about the Holocaust. It has been an honor to speaking to our military, colleges, and schools, sharing my past in order to create a better future. We must never forget the atrocities that happened in the Holocaust. When listening to a Holocaust survivor, you became a witness because there are still a lot of people in denial this Holocaust never happened. Thank you. And you mentioned your faith. Could you tell us how did the Holocaust affect your faith and your religion? I not a too religious man. I always believe in God, mm -hmm. and that's my faith. I, I always believe this God is behind me. And wherever I did, I see it now. I didn't know this is a miracle. I thought it came. Only now I see this, it started when they put me in three separate cars. Would think why they did it was no reason for it. The only thing is God did it. After this thing happened, I had faith in God. Mm -hmm. Only after this thing happened, my faith got so strong that I didn't think of nothing else. I think how to do the best way and how to go on with life and teach the same thing what I did to teach my kids and grandchildren. Uh, when I talk to schools, I got even an a email from my grandson, but he's now 34. He wrote an email to my 90th birthday. This is thanks. He thanks God and thanks me for teaching him the right way how to live and is using my guidance even today and is now 38 year, 43 years, 41 years old. He just got married and still didn't forget writing letters about it, thanking me for it. Thank you. Now, according to our timekeeper, Hannah, we have just run out of time for this segment. And I just, I'd like to have everyone give Ben a last round of applause for his amazing story. Thank you. And now. And now we have a special, we have a special recognition for you as a part um, from Dr. Sanchez. I thought everyone should come Benjamin, out. thank you for being here with us today and sharing your story. Thank you. We honor you, sir. Thank you for being with the Southwestern You're College welcome. community.
small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce my personal friend and award-winning Holocaust activist, Sandra Schuller. Hello, kids. <laughs> it's hot in here. Yes, it is. <laughs> Now, I am pleased to announce that Sandy is the 20, 2023 mm -hmm. recipient of this institution's mm -hmm. highest honor, the Southwestern College Honorary Degree. Congratulations, Sandy. So let's all give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sandy had an exhibit, Ruth, Remember Us the Holocaust, in the Chilla Vista Library, and it was an amazing success. And she will be having a new exhibit open in Rancho San Diego. So could you fill us in about what's going to be happening with that exhibit? And sure. I um, don't want to talk too much about it, because I want you to come and be surprised. What I noticed in the last exhibit was it talked about the South Bay, and I realized that my guidance, my buddy, my mentor here, Ben, said, what about us? What about the people in San Diego? And you gave me this amazing idea to focus on who the survivors are. It's very easy to go to the internet and read the stories and read about survivors, but I wanted people to be alive. And when you walk in the exhibit, you will actually think that you're looking at Holocaust survivors standing there. Now, there's a second part to this. I came up with the idea of Ruth, remember us, the Holocaust, and truth, tell, remember us, the Holocaust. So there'll be a small room, and it's at your risk to go in, which gives you a taste of what a gas chamber and what the atrocities are. And as you leave the exhibit, the goal is to honor those that are alive and continue mentoring us. So that's the thing. Now I'm not done yet, Nikki. <laughs> um, what I've done with the exhibit is what you do with your hand. You write, correct? Yes, I do. And I'm going to read you a poem. It's called The Palm. 27 bones, 35 muscles, Nearly 2,000 nerve cells, right, mm -hmm. are at each of our fingertips. That's more than enough to write Mein Kampf or Winnie the Pooh. Correct? Mm -hmm. And nobody knows this, Nikki, but you saved my life. When somebody came into the exhibit in Chula Vista, and told me, as it was coming down, that Jews lie, Jews steal, that the Auschwitz wall needs to stay up because it's where we're supposed to be dead. And when we were crying, where is God, where is God? God built us the Auschwitz wall. And had that been the first day of the exhibit, I don't know if I wanted to keep it up. And Ben said, no, 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 no. You keep going, girl. If he can do Auschwitz, I can do the next exhibit. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you know, it's really funny, Nikki, because I've been watching you. And I recently shared your article of El Sol and the magazine that saved my life with a grant maker. And upon telling them of your accomplishments, that you created the number one article and everything that's out there and the best magazine and 14 individual things and, and, and being 15, wait, you're gonna be 16. 17. 17, <laughs> 17 in two days from now, right? And, and I, I, I told them about Nikki. And you know, when I was putting the exhibit together, 
they, they wanted to give me some money. And I said, I don't want this money. I, I wanted to go to Nikki. It, it's apparent that you're getting ready to go to school, right? And, and the problem is that I can't get you to Columbia. I can't get you in Columbia. But what I can do is get you there. So I'd like to give you $5,000. I'd like to read where this comes from. Oh, here's the card. <laughs> Thank you. Dear Nicolette, the Holocaust didn't happen with death camps but with words. As a writer, you are cognizant of the power that the pen can hold. Your beautifully crafted article in El Sol, we must never forget, and of course the wonderful photograph that you used, <laughs> demonstrates more than just your strength and potential as a writer. It shows your empathy toward your fellow man. You understand the importance of the human story as told by Holocaust survivors as well as those that appreciate one's differences. We are proud of you and your work and hope that this scholarship award will help you on your journey to becoming the best writer you can be. As I said, I can't apply for you for Columbia, but I think I can get you there. And this is congratulations, Mazel Tov, Felicidades, from the Future Leaders Trust of Nevada. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Don't buy a Louis Vuitton bag. <laughs> <laughs> I won't.